thing in the water in different parts, but people had assumed that uh, this was actually a mannequin that someone had dumped in, or possibly a very elaborate hoax. They just didn't think for a second it was human until one man was, was walking past and he focused in on it and he, he looked and all of a sudden he realised that he was looking at a foot. Um, and he knew immediately this wasn't a dummy, this was a, a remains of a human being. So he phoned the guards and that started uh, what would become one of the most interesting murder investigations we've ever seen in Ireland. For a short time, the body in the canal became something of a public spectacle. The body or the body parts were visible in the canal. You could see arms and legs and a torso and a buttock section. And these were gradually removed from the canal and brought to the morgue for examination. The uh, guard that's so back with team then uh, moved in and uh, dredged the water. It was only eight foot deep. And it was upon that after trawling the rest of the section of canal that the other body parts were discovered. The body was removed from the water and uh, was pieced together basically. Um, back in the morgue. We were able to discover that the deceased had been, had been stabbed in excess of 20 times. There were no defensive wounds, which was notable. It meant that the deceased didn't get a chance to defend himself from attack. Initially, um, because of the effects of the water, the guards thought that this was a, a white man, a Caucasian man. Um, but then they realised that it was actually just the water had almost bleached the skin. Also, the the skin had started to come away from the bone. It was it was that wrinkly washerwoman effect uh, from being in the water. They put together the body and there was no head and there was no genitals, which was the first kind of alarm bells, really, you know, that, that they started to look immediately towards some sort of a ritual murder, um, they needed to obviously identify who this was so they could then trace back this individual's movements on the day. But identifying him became a huge problem. For us, the main thing was to get um, tissue or blood from the body in order to obtain the DNA profile so that if a potential victim came forward in the future that we would have something to match it back to. The Mulhalls, meanwhile, had been keeping an eye on things. Charlotte and Kathleen had remained in the area and presumably had walked by, had done a couple of walk-bys to make sure that the, the body was still where they'd left it. Um, so they pretty much found out straight away after it was found. They're, they were actually on the bridge looking into the, into the canal when the body was being removed. The press pictures from the scene showing the sub team at work show Charlotte and her mother watching from the bridge. Murderers often returned to the scene of the crime and certainly um, they were pictured there. A black man with no head and severed genitals. For a while, the ritual killing theory remained a significant line of inquiry. The police were very much of the belief that it was a ritual killing from the beginning. At the time, there had been a very high profile case in the UK called the Torso in the Thames. It was within an African community and there had been an awful lot of investigations there and it had been on the news big time about this, this story that this was a ritual killing. We interacted with the ritual killing juniors in South Africa to establish if we actually had a ritual killing. They were unsure. They were trying to identify where in Africa Farah Tswale Noor had come from, which sector of the African community to focus their investigations on when all of a sudden they got lucky with the, the Crime Stopper poster when somebody actually came forward and he was identified. A poster featuring Noor in a recognisable football jersey was what was to lead to his identification. And they used the soccer jersey on it and to try and jog people's memories. And sure enough, a friend of his put two and two together, realised that he hadn't heard from him or seen him for some time and that the last time he had met him, he was wearing that jersey. So he came forward to the guards, and that was the first major break in the case. As a result of the phone call we received, we were able to uh, identify that uh, Faris Wally Noor had been in the company of uh, the Mulhall sisters, that's Linda and Charlotte, and Kathleen Mulhall. So that proved very, very significant, and it led us then to carrying out an examination of what uh, Charlotte, Linda and Kathleen were at at that particular time. 
But it was in conversation with their brothers John and James Mulhall that the events of the night of March 2005 began to become clearer to Gardaí. The boys felt sorry for their mother and they contacted the police and said that they knew who had, who had killed Noor. They refused to make statements. They did give us a certain amount of background which certainly led us to suspect that uh, Kathleen, Charlotte and Linda were responsible for the death of uh, Faris Wally Noor. All the strands of inquiry were suddenly coming together and uh, through that the Gardaí were able to sort of build up a profile of who this victim was. But again, they had this big need to forensically prove who he was. To help in this process, Gardaí traced a woman with whom Noor had previously had a son. The arrival of the investigators came as no surprise. She was uh, listening to the news about this um, unidentified man that had been found in the canal and she had been following the story. So the minute the guards arrived at her door, she knew it was Farah and she was able to provide DNA through her son. We got a DNA profile from the son and from the mother of the son. And we found that half of the DNA of the son matched Faris Wally Noor, and the other half of the DNA of the son matched his mother. So we were able to say that Farah Noor was the father of this child. That sample was able to prove conclusively the body parts in the canal were the remains of Farah Noor. Now that the Gardaí had an identity, they knew who first to look for. We did discover that uh, Kathleen was living in the Richmond Cottages area of Dublin, and that proved very, very significant because Richmond Cottages is quite close to where the remains of Faris Wally Noor were discovered at Ballybock Bridge. When they went into the house, they discovered that there was a section of carpet completely missing, um, and it raised suspicions, so they um, brought in the forensic examiners to see if there was anything left there at the house that could give them an idea of what had happened. The problem with the scene was it had been lived in by two separate sets of tenants since Cathy Mulhall had lived there. It had been painted and redecorated and the carpets had been removed. So our chances of finding blood was very small. Initially, when we entered the bedroom, no blood staining was visible, but on examination, we discovered that there was quite a lot of small blood staining present in the bedroom. The most striking thing was spattered blood staining underneath the base of the bunk beds that were present in the room. You can never really clean up a crime scene that has had so much blood um, splattered all over it, but they did remark how incredibly well they had cleaned up the walls and they had you know, used bleach and they had done everything. They had, you know, they had quite forensically cleaned it, but there was, there was marks of blood where they couldn't get to, to clean between the floorboards. It was also the first time that we'd used luminol at a scene in Ireland. And luminol is a chemical which helps to identify degraded or cleaned up blood staining at scenes. And we could see that quite a lot of blood staining was apparent in the room and on the walls. We were satisfied at that point that uh, flat one, 17 Richmond Cottages was actually the scene where Father Faris Wally Noor had been actually murdered. Garthy knew the scene of the crime the victim of the crime, and had a good idea just who had committed the crime. The full horror of what happened in Summer Hill in March 2005 was about to be revealed. from blunt trauma. Some of them want to abuse you. Ah! Some of them want to be abused. Oh, well, what have we here? Vera, Tuesday at 9 on Virgin Media 3. Sponsored by AIG Insurance. Taking the drama out of car insurance. I asked my dentist which cleans better, an electric toothbrush or a manual one. She said, definitely electric. But don't just get anyone. Get one inspired by dentists. With the round brush head. 
GoPro with Oral-B Power. Unlike rectangular manual toothbrushes, Oral-B's rounded brush head surrounds each tooth to break up plaque and rotates to sweep it away. My teeth feel super smooth and really clean. Oral-B, the number one dentist recommended brand worldwide. Brush like a pro. I used to not know what to put on my skin because my skin was dull and super dry. But now I know. With my new Olay Retinol 24, my skin is fresh and bright. I put it on at night and when I wake up, I look in the mirror and I look at my skin because I'm like, what occurred overnight for my skin to be looking this bright and fresh? With Olay Retinol 24, my skin feels strong, bright and hydrated. I'm Lily Singh and I can face anything with my Olay Retinol 24. My skin feels awesome. Olay Collection, now available at selected Dunn stores. Did you know the source of odours in your home could be all your soft surfaces? Odours get trapped in your home's fabrics and are released back over time. Febreze Fabric Refresher eliminates odours. Its water-based formula safely penetrates fabrics where odours hide. Spray it on your carpets, your furniture, and even on clothes you want to wear again. Make Febreze part of your tidying up routine for an all-over freshness you'll love. Febreze. Breathe happy. We all use a lot more water than we should. But we're on a mission to change that. Finish Quantum Ultimate's superior formula cleans, degreases and shines without having to waste water pre-rinsing. So let's turn off the taps. Together, we can all make a real difference. Tired of clean clothes that lose their freshness too soon? Now they can smell fresh for weeks. Add Lenore Unstoppable's in-wash scent boosters directly into the drum before every wash and enjoy non-stop freshness that lasts and lasts. Lenore Unstoppable's non-stop freshness for weeks. Ugh. What's that? You can't wear that to the interview. Use Calgon 3-in-1 in every wash to protect your machine from limescale, residues and malodor. Cleaner machine, cleaner clothes. But is it free from bacteria? Calgon Antibacterial Gel. The only water softener to eliminate 99.9% .9 of bacteria. I make lots of little sounds when I care for Theodore. Like this. And this. But there's one really important sound. That click clack means the very non bio safety lid is shut. So Theodore is safe and his clothes are super soft. So remember, always close the pack with a click clack. And keep it out of reach of children. Just like our skin, our hair changes over time. So Pantene created the Hair Biology Collection to help control oiliness, fight unruliness, boost volume, and reduce yellow tones. With rose water, hyaluronic acid, lotus flower, and jojoba oil for a lifetime of great hair. This is our nothing can stop us hair. Pantene, the power of hair. discovery of body parts in the Royal Canal in March 2005 led to an intensive Gartha manhunt for the murderers of Kenyan national Farah Sawale Noor. Sisters Linda and Charlotte Mulhall killed Noor and then dismembered the body. But they disposed of his head a number of miles away in a park in Tala. A very vigilant member of the public had spotted the head sticking up from the ground in the park in Tala and he had contacted, uh, it had occurred to him that it might be the head of the uh, body found in the canal, and he had contacted uh, South Dublin County Council to ask them about it, and, and the rangers there had actually seen it, and they reassured him that it wasn't a head, but by now, in any event, Linda had been back and had moved it. It was only after a couple of days that Linda decided, for whatever reason, she wasn't happy where the head had been buried. In a surreal turn of events, Linda, intoxicated, made another attempt to get rid of the final piece of Farah Noor. In a drunken state, she had actually dug up the head again and took it to another area into the Dublin mountains, where she spent the day with uh, Farah Swallow Noor's head. Got so drunk on vodka that she was actually talking to the head, uh, asking Farah to forgive her for what she'd done, telling him it should have been her mother who um, had died that night. Um, but the head has never been recovered. 
Racked with conscience and in a fragile physical state, Linda Mulhall agreed to speak to the Gardaí. Linda had completely unravelled. When she was supposed to give the first interview, she had actually tried to commit suicide and ended up in hospital. She'd slashed her wrists. She was in a very, very bad way. She was taking a huge amount of drugs. She wasn't sleeping. Um, and she was really being eaten alive by what had happened. Her father and her sister, Mary, uh, were really appealing to her conscience, telling her, you know, she had to go to the police. So eventually she agreed. John called the, the guards to come and interview her. Uh, but when they came, she had disappeared. It turned out she was in Tala Hospital. She had uh, attempted suicide. Now, two days later, she was ready for that interview, and she basically told them everything that had happened in that night. The attempted rape, the slashing of the throat, the dismemberment, the dumping. She told them everything. It was very emotional because she cried and she, she was very sincere. I think she realized the enormity of what she had done. She said that the smell that she got when they were cutting up the remains was still in her mind, in her nostrils. She couldn't get away from the fact of what she did and she realized that she had committed a terrible deed. Uh, very emotional going through the exact details of Charlotte stabbing uh, Farah in the neck with a knife and the fact that she got a hammer and hit him a large number of times. It was almost like a cathartic experience for her to go through it all. She brought them back to the scene, told them exactly what had happened. She brought them to where she had buried the head. She explained the whole, the, that whole night of horror to them. Charlotte Mulhall, however, was not as forthcoming. Charlotte was brought in and Charlotte claimed that um, Linda had lied. Everything that Linda had said was a lie, that it was Kathleen who had um, murdered Noor. She was trying to protect her sister, but eventually I think she realised the game was up and, you know, y y she couldn't deny it any further, so she admitted everything and corroborated the full story that Linda had given to the guards. Kathleen had completely cut off all contact with her daughters, so uh, Charlotte no longer felt any loyalty to her mother. She had murdered this man to save her mother, as she thought, and this was the reward. She had brought this man into their lives, moved him into the family home, and caused no end of grief. And then when he was murdered, she absconded to the UK, left them to pick up the pieces. Linda and Charlotte were both charged with murder and pleaded not guilty in the Central Criminal Court. Their trial took place in October 2006. Well, the trial was uh, um, one of those sort of trials that don't come along very often where people have to be turned away from the, um, from the Central Criminal Court because there just isn't room for them. Um, it was just that the idea that three women could actually chop up a man um, and that events in, in the flat that night that nobody should stop. It just, um, people were absolutely gripped by it. Linda didn't actually turn up for the first day of the trial. And it was only when Detective Inspector Christy Mangan, who was heading the case, tracked her down and persuaded her to come back to court that she did. She was, more than anything else, genuinely worried about her children. She was extremely fragile. Her mental state was not good. And I suppose in her mind, she just couldn't face what was about to come. It was hard to believe that they had done what they had done, but the evidence was all given and the jury um, went to deliberate. It was thought that they'd come back very, very quickly, but in actual fact, it took them days to come up with their verdict. Charlotte subsequently received the mandatory life sentence uh, for murder. Linda was convicted of manslaughter and she received a 15-year term of imprisonment. We were very honest and cooperated with the police and told them what had happened. And I don't really think that was reflected in the sentence that, they, that was imposed on them. It was a very emotional time for both of them, you could see. Her brothers were in court, um, very, very emotional, a lot of, a lot of crying. Uh, and at the end of the trial, Linda, you know, she expressed her gratitude to the investigation team about, about the fair way she was treated. Um, she was very appreciative of that and she shook hands and she, she kissed me on the side of the cheek and we said goodbye. But the tragedy of the case wasn't to end there. In December 2005, the pressure became too much for John Mulhall. 
John Mulhall was a very complex character. I think he had some degree of panic about what happened, specifically about his knowledge of it and whether he could be, face charges in relation to that. We had a certain amount of evidence that would have indicated that he was in contact with the girls on the night of the murder. Uh, he was interviewed in relation to it. He denied that he had any hand act or part in relation to the murder. He wrote a suicide note on the back of a 50 euro note. He addressed it to his daughter, Mary, and um, he said he loved her, but he just couldn't cope with what had happened, and he killed himself. But it, I don't think in any circumstances he could be described as a good father uh, to Charlotte and Linda Mulhall. I think that he was just another one of those individuals, uh, a responsible adult in their life who was anything but responsible. The trial and subsequent sentencing led to the sisters being given the most notorious nickname in Irish criminal history. The two girls were branded the Scissor Sisters, a name which they absolutely despised and hate still to this day, because it portrays them as monsters. And as they, they claim, you know, they're not monsters, it was just something which happened which they sincerely and really badly regret. Kathleen Mulhall returned to Ireland in February 2008. She eventually did. She was going to be extradited. She knew that she was going to be extradited if she didn't. And while they couldn't um, charge her with murder, she was charged in relation to her role in, in the killing of, of Farah. Um, she was given five years in prison and she joined her daughters in Mount Joy. Despite saying in later interviews how much she loved her two daughters and how they were innocent and not monsters the way they had been portrayed in the media. She still never turned up for any of their trial and fled to the UK, so basically left the two girls to face the wrath of the courts on their own. Farah Sawale Noor was a violent and unpredictable man who had been the cause of much tragedy for many other people. His murder and its brutality, however, demonstrated the levels to which humans are prepared to go, particularly when they have endured difficult personal circumstances. I think the, the guards realised that this murder had happened during a hugely chaotic day of drink and drugs, and with a lot of emotions going on. Um, they hadn't set out to murder Noor, but it was really what they did after he was killed that showed how calculated they were. Had the murder occurred in that spur of the moment, you know, when tensions had risen in the house, had they at that point, uh, you know, called for help and put their hands up, uh, it would have been a completely different situation, but they had gone to such lengths to cover it up that I think they were seen as very calculating. When you analyse what actually happened that night, it happens quite regularly in all societies where something happens when people are drunk, someone picks up a knife and they stab someone and another person maybe hits them. It was the dismemberment of the victim's body which made this a notorious killing. And it was more shocking because there were women that had engaged in this and they were seen as ordinary women and they were sisters. He had lied all the way and he had committed crimes while he was here and he had um, raped women and, you know, had he survived, God knows how long more or how many more victims he would have taken himself. For the Mulhall family, the murder is just another tragic episode in a spiral of violence, drugs and abuse. I think we're absolute products of a dysfunctional family, of bad parenting, and of adults who were never able to develop properly while growing up, and they were never really uh, given the morals and the that moral compass we all need to get us through life. The lives of Charlotte and Linda Mulhall were mapped before they even began in terms of the amount of heroin um, and violence in that house that they grew up. They were really let down by everyone right from beginning to end. It was important not to be critical of them and to gain some insight into their mental anguish, what they were going through, and then engage with them on an emotional level, and it certainly worked. They didn't just go out and pluck a random stranger and kill them in this way. They 
they were protecting their mother when they killed him. And, um, but undoubtedly they, they will go down in history as the Scissor Sisters.